Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first dance talk of the 2021-2022 season. We had hoped to have you here with us in the Margaret L. Keck Williams Dance Lab, but the Delta variant had other plans. Um, we are, are very excited to be a step closer to a normal dance talk with the five of us all here together. Um, and please know that we've been following Houston Ballet and Houston Method Methodist testing protocols so that we can be here together tonight mask-free. Um, our fingers and toes will be crossed that for the next dance talk, we'll all be here together. As, as we are talking, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. As always, we will have time for your questions at the end of our facilitated conversation. And I'm gonna start tonight with some introductions. My name is Jen Summers. I'm Academy Director here at Houston Ballet, and I am joined tonight by Stanton Welch, our Artistic Director, um, Kelly Gilson, our general manager, who uh, is usually one of the superheroes behind the scene, but we thought we'd take her cape off and bring her in front of you tonight. And then we have uh, Connor Walsh, principal dancer. Um, Connor joined the company in 2004, was promoted to soloist in 2006, and principal dancer in 2007. And then to his left, soloist Bridget Kuhns, who joined the company in 2013, was promoted to demi-soloist in 2016, and to soloist in 2017. And as Academy Director, I would be remiss if I didn't say that both Connor and Bridget are Academy alum. So, I was, I'm sure in your homes you're giving them a wonderful round of applause. <laughs> so tonight we're gonna start by looking back at last season. Since the pandemic began, Stanton has created several films with the dancers and his film crew and artistic staff. He began with a Zoom ballet, or as we like to call it, a Zale, in May of 2020. And just last week, we released the film version of his ballet play. So I thought we'd start talking about the films. When it became a reality that we were not gonna be able to have a season last year on stage, why did you feel it was important to find some other way to create? Well, we had first uh, started gathering and having these town hall meetings with the company and uh, we immediately started to produce a, sort of some at-home things. And I remember at one point we were talking about what should we do next? And I think it was Karina said, well, why don't you do something? <laughs> uh, it was in that kind of roundabout way. And I thought, well, yeah, I mean, why don't we do something? And then actually make it not just at-home projects, but a, a company project, um, because they'd been producing all these great at-home things. So um, I just I jumped into the mix of that. And then uh, we got to use David and Lisa and uh, the different environments and could uh, not upgrade it, but change it into sort of an ensemble collective video. Um, Kelly, what were the considerations you had to take into account um, in order to make these projects, which were br really brand new to Houston Ballet? So not only were we in a global pandemic, we're creating it in an entirely different way. Um, what are the logistical considerations that you and your team had to tackle in order to make Stanton's vision for these films come to pass? Sure. Well, in the beginning, we just we had this goal that we wanted to get together and we wanted to create art. And how did we do that? And in the early stages, it was just how do we even communicate to one another when we're all in our homes, we're separate spaces. So a lot of that was about getting internet access and Zoom capability and all the challenges that come with that and dropping access and pets and family members coming in. And so just, but finding those avenues that we could communicate changes and information and it was ever changing um, was sort of the first hurdle that we had to go, okay, how do we connect to one another? And then it was, how do we create? And I think Stan really led the way and the dancers too in being flexible and adaptable and finding these ways to create this movement in, in their home spaces and, and the creativity that came out of that was uh, just phenomenal and so inspiring. So in those first early stages with that first project was just, okay, we're connected. Um, and then trying to move back into the studios presented a whole nother <laughs> set of, of challenges in itself. And we are, we are so fortunate, as you, you mentioned earlier with Houston Methodist, to have these medical partners to give us guidance on how we can operate safely. But there were so many things we had to learn and explore how to get each other back safely. And 
that was capacity in the studios, that was distancing from one another to keep each other safe, filtration. air filtration, cleaning of the floors, um, masking, and when you're, you have to exert energy, and uh, it just felt like there was so many levels that we had to look into to make sure we were bringing people back together as safe as possible, keeping everyone healthy, and that's changed a multitude of times <laughs> over the past 18 months on what guidance we have, what information. Um, and so I think, those again, those communication tools, having weekly Zoom meetings, I think we met more in the past 18 months than the time of years that I've been here. Um, but to have the, that chance to share information and, and try to get all on the same page when things are just in flux. So in, in the process of making the films, and I think Stanton alluded to the fact that, so there was that first Zoom ballet. Some of the films were made right here in the Center for Dance. Others were made all over Houston. Um, but one of the things that you did to keep everybody safe was really pre-vaccine is keep everybody separate. Um, yeah. I mean, it, the evolution of the ballets were the evolution of what Kelly was, so COVID happened. First of all, they had to do class and we had to learn how to communicate and how to get class to them in their home. So that was a good several months. But then the, the first ballet was made at home with us sending the material to them, them learning it off their phones themselves, no contact. And then the next series of works, we rehearsed and made it with them individually. They taught it to other dancers and then we filmed them individually. And then there were projects where we were tied it together in a group and went off and made them. So you can sort of see that evolution as we got better at what we were doing and... Uh, the pandemic evolved. Uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So for Connor and Bridget, you spent your whole lives until March 2020 being live performers. It was all your work geared towards performing live for an audience. For, can you both talk a little bit about the transition to film and how uh, uh, last year was was either changed you as an artist or things that you maybe brought forward from the film year back into this year? Yeah, um, so I think it's kind of well known. Dancers don't like watching themselves on video a lot of the time. So that was actually a big thing to learn, was learning to watch the choreography on a video, film yourself and then watch yourself and make sure you're doing the right thing. So if anything, that's a great skill that we have all learned now. That actually watching ourselves on video is a good thing. But also, I mean, it was just so different not dancing with everyone. We feed off of each other's energy, having the choreographer in the room, that's how we actually learn things correctly and do it right. So you would film yourself and you'd kind of be like, am I doing it right? And I would look to see if maybe like Connor's, and it's like, all right, I'm by myself. I have to like actually know what I'm doing. So it was definitely like a big learning curve in the beginning and not having our little ballet family around was difficult. Yeah, I mean, in the, the early stages, we're, we're such creatures of habit dancers. You know, we, we have such strict routines. And to have that broken, it not only had like a, just what do I do, how do I go about my day, but it had a big social and emotional reaction for all of us. Um, and the, like, the only schedule we had was the things that Houston Ballet was giving us, which was so fantastic. Um, but one of the big challenges is that we are, as you're saying, like by yourself and we normally a dancer, we rehearse a ton. We prepare so much before we hit the stage. We spend so many hours prepping and making sure we, we talk about every possible outcome of a step, every um, possible things that our costumes could do, our partners could do. Um, when you're working with a new creation, you experiment. Um, when you're working with film, it, there's a lot more spontaneity involved. There's a lot more in the moment adaptation. Um, and when you're talking about like rehearsing on Zoom, we're rehearsing ballets in a Zoom world where the music's not syncing up with Stanton and we're having all these technological difficulties of being like, wait, is it on count five or six? I don't know what the music, uh, you know, we've all gotten much better at the te technological part of it all, but that was a huge challenge. Um, and then we were also doing a lot of work outdoors to keep us safe and that kind of pre presents a whole nother challenge is that Normally we have a studio process that lasts months that makes us feel confident and sure and we work in front of a mirror. As Bridget was saying, we're, we're stripped of our mirror, which dancers love. <laughs> and that was a huge adaptation. And then we're, we're adapting to Stanton's like, hey, can we try this on this grass? Can we try this on these stairs? You know, 
then playing with the elements, which was, is um, not something we often do. And if we do, it's done through a tech rehearsal and a dress rehearsal and a long thought out process. Um, so that adaptability has kind of been a long a theme that the staff is always talking about to the dancers of how we need to keep, uh, stay flexible, not in the legs high sort of way, but emotionally and with our mindset, uh, because things were always changing and, and we didn't know how to prepare exactly how we normally do. I'm, I'm surprised to hear you say um, that you found the, the world of film to have more spontaneity. Um, I guess because film is, once you've filmed it, it's, it, it is what it is. Well, it's about the edit. So I think the process is similar. So we would make the choreography and all that experimentation happens with us and then we put the product on the stage. That experimentation happens with David in the editing room after we have gone. So all those experiments, you have to film. Film it angry, film it sad, film it this way, film it that way, film it left, film it right, film it. So that when he goes away to make the ballet, to make the film, he has all those experiments. And when I make it to live. Choose from, yeah. Basically. And when I make it live, I'm doing that with them. And that's part of the process as we. So that was, I think, a big learning curve was to collect as much as we can, get it into the editing room to give them as much variety of what it could look like. When you got, when you saw, given all of that, when you saw the final project each time, were you surprised by what you saw as, since you were part of the editing process? Absolutely, I mean, uh, I'm sure Bridget would agree that we, especially a lot of these projects were quite early on, so we were really isolated. So the first projects were in our apartments, um, so we were really not seeing each other. Then the next projects were a little outside, but we were filming individually and doing, you know, bringing everyone together with the magic in the edit room. Um, so yeah, it was a real reveal, you know, because I, sometimes you only had small sections or sometimes you had filmed a lot and you never knew exactly what parts were gonna get in there. Um, but it was a real joy for us to kind of watch what our colleagues were doing, because that's something we miss a lot is dancing around our peers and this is our family and, and we're stripped away from that. So. Um, it was always a lot of fun, and it was like a big reveal party. Everyone would kind of get their popcorn around the Zoom table to watch the, the reveal of the video, and there was a lot of elements that you hadn't seen yet, because you know normally, you, by the time we get into the show, I know exactly what that dancer's doing out on stage. But this, I hadn't seen a lot of the material that had been cooked up, so it was a fun, fun element. I mean, the end of Honey You, the first time I saw it in edit before they see it, having the six or eight of them in a line, and it looked like they were together. And I had to remind myself they weren't together. And that was very emotional. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a duet that happened too, that suddenly, I think it's, yeah, a few duets. It was just to see them in that same frame together when we'd never rehearsed it together. I'd never seen, you know, that was really touching. Yeah. So, right, as we're about to take the conversation into this season, but you were mentioning um, flexibility and adaptability. Are there, are those the things, I mean, are you able to retain the sort of things that you learned last year? Do you, do you notice them present this year? And I mean, that's for anybody, not just the dancers. Like the well, I would say we're not through it that's at true. all <laughs> yet. So that's true. It felt like, uh, and I used the analogy of lifeboats with them a bit, we had the ship crashed, we got on lifeboats, we got to a desert island and we were very happy. And we had a few weeks running around eating all the bananas and mangoes. Then we realized we were on a desert island with as many deadly traps and terrible things as what we had before, they were just different. And now we're trying to do all that COVID coping, which is a lot of stuff, and our normal life. So it's almost double, almost double the pressure. It's certainly not, it does not feel like it's a calm, it, we just now know the puzzle. Yeah, we, we, we can anticipate some of the yeah. sand traps, yeah. Uh, can I add to that, just that, like you were saying, have we been able to keep some of that stuff we've learned? I mean, I think a lot of us would agree that the first couple of weeks was really hard because we, or at least personally for me, I was at this speed. I was down here, I was really slow and calm, and. And when we're working in the studio and you're switching studios every 55 minutes and all of a sudden we're working on six different ballets, we were at this speed, you know? And it was, it was really hard for me, particularly in the early stages, to hold on to those sort of mental and emotional lessons that I've learned or set myself to do post-pandemic. And now I start to feel everybody sort of, okay, wait, get it resetting because all of a sudden you're like, 
you felt like you just jumped into a moving car. You know, all of a sudden we're like, oh my God, we're rehearsing, we're going. And it's just like, oh, okay, wait, I can breathe and it's okay, you know? But there was definitely a transition for me coming back into this, um, just to this hard working environment when I was really working at my own pace a lot in my home, quite privately, at any time of the day. You know, like, you know we, so um, that's a big shift for me and I think for the staff and for the dancers, it's just you're not on your own schedule anymore. You have to go to other people's schedules and adapting to other people's needs. Um, and I think we're, we're starting to find that balance again. It was definitely tricky the first couple of weeks. So as we gear up for our first live performance in 18 months, hurrah, a week and two days away, um, it, it wasn't, um, you're sort of alluding to this, Connor, but it wasn't, or, and you actually said to more, maybe Stanton, we're not going back. It's not like, oh, we're back at 2019. Um, we're, we're, Kelly, what are some of the logistical challenges that your team and Stanton, I would just want to be clear that as much as Stanton is a front of, a front of house or front of the scene kind of person, he's also really involved in the logistics. What are some of the things um, that you're having to negotiate as we return to live performance and we're still in a global pandemic? A lot of it is the same. It, it's some of the same issues that we were, we've been facing since the beginning of the pandemic. And we knew that our goal was we want to get back on stage and we want to get everyone together back on stage. And so that presented some additional challenges, but it was the same same conversations. What do we do about capacity? How many people can we bring together safely? Do they have to be distanced? Can they have partners? Can they interchange partners? Do they need to wear masks? How much do they need to be tested to make sure we can get a company of 50 plus dancers on stage, plus all the other people that are join us backstage? We have crew and wardrobe and musicians and students, staff and students. And so it was, I felt an even bigger challenge because we had all those same little elements that we had to look into um, but also on this much bigger scale. And we, we had been so small, as Connor was saying, um, for so long. And then we have made this grand leap to jumping back to tens and tens, you know, 50 people together, 200 people out backstage together. Um, so we had to, to figure out how to, how to adapt all those things to make, to make people as safe as possible. So the primary goal being health and safety of all the artists. Absolutely while getting back on stage. Yeah. yeah. And then with the pressure of dates and deadlines, when we were in COVID, if someone, if we needed to move the time of the filming, we'd shifted it to another day. We moved it in the afternoon, we'd call someone else in, but we can't. On Thursday, we're all there, we're presenting something live, collectively. Uh, <laughs> there's a much different pressure to that than... Uh, and, and the changes of information, because what was working on Tuesday doesn't necessarily mean it's working on Wednesday or the information has now changed again on Thursday. And so that's still something that we're facing as well. The fluid nature of COVID, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Stanton, as we, re we realized that the return to stage was possible and imminent, what are the things you took into account um, when you created the season's programming? And, and for now, if you can talk about sort of the whole season. Uh, well, initially, we really wanted to push as much of the repertoire after Nutcracker as possible so that we knew that we had the big full lengths and the ballets that would function more normally, meaning we have guest artists coming in to choreograph or create or stage all after Christmas and really make Nutcracker sort of our first big event. Um, and then as things started to look, this is before Delta, <laughs> as things started to look better, we put in this Jubilee program, which was at first an idea of just a stretch an hour. And then as, as we took our masks off and everything, uh, we extended it to a full program, then Delta hit. Um, but we already felt like we'd rehearsed and planned enough with them. They'd been rehearsing these pieces, a lot of them for a year or so, um, that we were ready. And it was all ballets that I, we feel very trusting with the dancers with things that are comfortable for them. Puffy, hard, scary, but comfortable in they're not something new. Um, and that the first program had a lot of adaptability. So it might be a different show every night. <laughs> and we have that plan and that's okay. And then I made a big group community ballet because we haven't made one of those for a year and a half and having everyone on stage and we just know that that will fluctuate and that's 
sort of reflective of what we need to be. So it's that kind of program. So the Jubilee's, an, uh, it's a celebration of the return to stage, but also a transition. Yeah, right? and we have the greatest hits of all these uh, artists. And yeah. if you're a fan of the different dancers in the company, come and see different nights because it really is a different show each night. Yeah. So the company came back on August 10th. You just talked, Connor, a little bit about how there was a ramp up for you in terms of oh my gosh, this is, this is right, this is what it's like to have a six, six hours of rehearsal. What did it feel like, I wondered if you could put into words, to, to walk into class and be in class with a big group of dancers again? Um, I would say it was equal parts exciting and also overwhelming. I felt like I was an apprentice again, and it was the first day of company class where I didn't know where to stand. I suddenly didn't know how to spot in a pirouette. I was like, someone's so close to me, how do I lift my leg up? It was like, it took me again about two or three weeks to readjust to dancing with 55 people in the room. I mean, we're very spatially aware, but we were very lucky with our 10 foot boxes and I didn't have to worry about hitting anyone or anyone being in my way or me getting in anyone else's way. Um, so it was very exciting to see all of my friends and see people's dancing and to be close to them. And then at the same time, I think I only did half the combinations because I was just scared. I was like, I can't go. I can't fit into this group anymore. Um, but like, like he was saying earlier, I think now the company, we're starting to mellow out. We're getting back into our groove. We're starting to run things more full out and in their entirety. And it's just slowly starting to feel back to normal as in much as it can right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I've mentioned this before in other talks. Like, when we started, when we were by ourselves in the beginning, it was really hard to kind of motivate yourself. Or at least you thought you were working hard, but you didn't have a lot to compare your, <laughs> your work to. You know, it was just, just you. Um, and so once you, we started getting back in little pods, it was like, oh, great, it was 10 people. And just that extra person, you kind of push each other, that little friendly competition or, or just seeing somebody else's determination makes you more determined, right? Or you see their high legs and, oh, I got to work on mine, you know? Um, there's, so there was that element, right? Times six or whatever, so all of a sudden you have 60 people in there. Um, but it was intense. I mean, uh, going back to what I was saying about the speed of things, but we are so aware, right, physically, and this whole pandemic we're talking about being aware physically in the opposite way, of getting away from each other, of being spatially spread out, and all of a sudden to kind of like let that go was, was kind of tricky. I mean, everyone is masked in the studio, so there's definitely a layer of protection, but it took a little bit of time, I think, for everybody's um, nerves to kind of settle in. Um, and now it just kind of feels like feels like it's always been, you know, we're just bumping into each other and, you know, <laughs> then cramming in and, and into groups as, as we always have, yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Margaret Alkeck Williams Jubilee of Dance. That was your invention, right? And what was your, um, when you first conceived of it, not, not for the season, but sort of as a, as a gala night, way what, back, way back what, were you, what were you thinking and what were your intentions? Um, I always loved as a student or as a person who went to, uh, as an audience member, those evenings where you could go and see the Australian Ballet or San Francisco Ballet, whichever company I was watching, and all their principles would be on in things that often were created on them or special to them, became sort of their signature works. Um, and that was always just, in, it, it's inspiring. It's like the Disney float parade. You want to come out and see all the characters. Yes, I want to go to some things, but there's a nice thrill about that and that it's a special one-off, and um, which it normally is, and this year we have a few shows, but I think there's something dynamic. They prepare for it. They do it only once. There's something unique. Its life is very short, um, and I think that that's what's inspiring. And for this Jubilee, again, it's a little bit different this year because there's multiple performance, multiple performances, but what were your considerations when you picked the repertoire for this year? Well, we have uh, Melody Minichi's 20th anniversary this season, so uh, I wanted to make sure that there was a part of her in there that I thought would really uh, be nice to celebrate her. Um, we have, of course, some good old classical ballet, which we haven't had for a while with Corsair and Don Q. We have uh, some divergence, which is ensemble work, which is something that we needed to do again. And then sort of all the made on classics, uh, Connor and Karina and Sylvia and Madame Butterfly with Yuriko and Chris Kuma. Um, 
half of the map, my brain <laughs> is evaporated on what those pas de deux are. But it's that kind of thing. And then the last ballet is taking six or seven of the songs of Dead South and putting them into a big ensemble piece with every dancer in the company on stage. So. So let's talk a little bit about that. For those of you who haven't yet seen In Good Company in its film version, it did premiere in May. And there were 11 songs initially, right? Um, and we did so much last year of either taking, quite often taking existing uh, ballets, um, like, like play, um, the, the Mozart ballet, um, and, and, and turning them into films, some of, the nut, some of the Nutcracker stuff for the holiday performance. But with this, you're flipping the narrative. It is. Um, I haven't thought of that until you said it. Yes. And so we're like seizing back from film land live performance. But um, I kind of feel like I did originally want to do this as a live okay. ballet. So it did exist in my head before film. Mm -hmm. um, and then it became a completely different thing. And now it's a completely different thing. You can't take it back to what you had conceived. Yeah. But it's interesting, yeah. And so what, I mean, obviously, the, major change, when, and it's true what Stantonson was saying earlier, when you watch the group pieces in the film, you really do believe the dancers are all, are all together, but they weren't. So when you, you had them in the room, what were the, did you retain a lot of what was in the film, or did you... Yeah, I think we retained everything. I think, of course, there's more, and it's, it's played with and changed, but I think there's nothing, even some of the effects of the film, like the kaleidoscope, is there in some capacity or a motif to it or something, a reflection to it. But I think you could tell the film to the, the ballet in some mm -hmm. capacity. So did you, did you, I guess, choreograph some of the edits that David made? Did you try to choreograph them into the dance? Is that what you're saying? Well, David and I worked together on the edit prior to the making of it, so I, we'd have a rough skeleton and then he would do things. But like in the kaleidoscope, I just said I wanted to look like a kaleidoscope and then I gave him, I think, four or five rhythms of arms and then they made it into that circle. Mm -hmm. So that exists in the ballet. Of course, we can't see it. with all of them at the same time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. There's, there's some kind of reflection on it. But I'm, I'm curious because we're only just finishing it now. I only feel like we've run it a couple of times. I need to see it more to know. I what think you've the, done. Yeah, and the difference in the film is the intimacy. So suddenly with David, we can be in close to their face. And how do you create that on stage? So trying to use the ensemble to be the walls and the barrier to push the people forward to feel like you're intimate with them. Yeah even though you're in this huge space with, you know, 60, 50 dancers, right, yeah. Right, That is something about the, the year of film is how intimately, how close Definitely. we were to the dancers, yeah. yeah. And how different it is to act into film than it is to be on stage. And I'm sure it was a unique experience for all of them to find that in themselves, how to make love to the camera. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that, you two, bringing uh, In Good Company from film to stage and the, the sort of how you felt about it and what the challenges have been? Um, well, I say, I guess taking something for film to the stage, like, or vice versa, one of the challenges is when you're performing for stage, you sort of train to engage through with a whole audience, right? An audience of 2,000 people with multiple levels. And in film, you're more likely dealing with one person, the camera, or you're whoever you're acting with. So. A dancer's posture and focus, all of that is a big shift for us because a lot of times we would film things and then stand would be like, all I can see is your chin. You know, because we're like out there performing for the whole house, like we're at the matter, the word in theater. Like, and we're like, okay, we need to bring it down and we need to just be a, a person rather than a ballet dancer. Um, and that's how you learned in good company. It was as a person. Yeah, a but person. all of our tendencies, you know, as soon as you play the music, all my tendencies as a ballet dancer just come crawling right out and I, I, I immediately bring things up and so a lot of the takes, the notes, we're constantly bringing it more into the camera and more into an intimate place. Um, and so now we're at a place where we can kind of free things up and make it bigger and I think what Stanton's doing is, he, you know, he references the kaleidoscope, it's quite fitting that like now I'm looking, if I think back to the videos, it's like the kaleidoscope before you've turned it yeah. and now what he's doing with it is he's turning the kaleidoscope and so now it's, he's adding color and making multiple, you know, it's like when you look through something as one thing and then you spin it and then it becomes many, many, many things with lots of different colors. So it's, a, I know it was in the film, but it's a fitting analogy to what's coming to, to the stage as well. It's like that kaleidoscope still going because it's, the stage is very layered and there's lots of 
canons and textures to the choreography that's already there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a little bit playing on what you had just said about how when we did it as a film, we did it very much as people, as ourselves. And I kind of think if we had done it the other way around, if we had done it on stage first and been our stage selves, it would have been a lot harder to bring it back for film. And I think the beauty of it is, is the piece itself is very pedestrian. We are ourselves, we are real people. We're not a swan, we're not a prince, we're not a queen. We're not these fantasies, we're just real humans. And it's nice to see now, you can see how people did it on film. They're doing it like that in the studio and it seems so genuine, you know, it's, it's Allie Miller dancing, it is Jack Wolf dancing. It's not them putting on a character of their tired, exhausted, just happy to be back in the studio selves. So it feels very genuine and it's, I think it's gonna be great. So I'm just gonna ask this so everyone can look for it. What this kaleidoscope part, which section is that in? <laughs> just so we have something. I think Connor was using it as an analogy for the whole ballet. The whole ballet, okay. Um, I use it in Ballad of Jaunowski at the end of the song uh, the dancers do this arm movement uh, and it, it opens, it's a kaleidoscope, it spins yeah, like a circle yeah, yeah. and they fall down the drain. Yeah. And it was sort of them doing just, I think, four simple rhythms. Um, in our, you know, YouTube, there's a song by a, a band called Feast, called One, Two, Three, Four. Oh, and it really inspired me, this group canon like that choreographically and that was yeah. what was that, so I call that the kaleidoscope. Yeah, and I was just saying, for people who have seen the, you know, our audience, who I'm sure have seen a lot of the, the films, wondering what this project is gonna look like on the stage, and yeah. um, a lot of the times there is the entire company on stage, so there are all those textures, so we don't have David's great editing um, to help us add all those layers, so Stanton's doing with the, Body. the bodies, with the masses of the company, so, um, we, the dancers, are the edit and the color and the, you know, all those different layers, so, um, yeah. And that's the great thing or the different thing about film and live performance. The audience does the editing in live shows. Yeah. You sit there, you choose to watch Bridget, you watch Connor. So every person, we can sit beside each other and have a completely different experience from the same thing. That's the great special thing about, about live, live performance. performance, that as beautiful as film is, uh, you know, uh, that that is the difference. You know, that, that special thing about in this show, who you choose to watch, where you follow, is back in the hands of the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, we direct it for sure, lights too, but it's still free. And it's a beautiful analogy, Connor, to think that like the, the dancers are the color and the texture, and we have such an amazing group that each one brings something special. That's really yeah. Lovely. Like Bridget was saying, there's you know there's a lot of characters, and it's the the people bringing those characters of themselves, you know, and um, so I think you'll really see those, particularly within each movement. So I think the the company will really shine in the work mm -hmm. as as individuals and as a whole. Yeah. Absolutely, it's a bit of the story of what we've been through. That you know we arrive back our ballet company's community we're a team we chose these professions that can only exist and create collectively we dust ourselves off we're excited to be back they get back empowered and then they welcome the audience i mean that's the idea of the right. the piece and every single company member will be will, will be on stage together as we close Jubilee. yep dancing in unison together ah oh, can't wait you had a, a wonderful opportunity last week to have the band, the Dead South, we in did. the studio. You want to talk a little bit about what that was like? Well, they've just been brilliant the entire time. So right from the get-go, they were fast and nice to deal with from us contractually. Uh, what song? Any song. You know, it was like, oh, my God, great. <laughs> I was just storing stuff. Then they were very... They spoke with us. We did uh, talks together. Then they came and met the dancers, and they performed here in town. So... Uh, they, I think they really enjoy the collaboration and they enjoyed seeing their rhythms and their music uh, danced, you know, it brings out different things. Yeah, it was great. I mean, it was fun to have them in the studio and, you know, I think dancers, we always are trying to honour the musicians and the music that we're dancing to. That's, you know, one of our first and foremost responsibilities and to get to perform it, you know, even if it was just a rehearsal in the earlier stages for the musicians themselves who created the work, who composed it, is really special. Um, and to see them bobbing their heads and stomping their feet and getting into what we're doing, um, that, mean, that means a lot to us. And I, I think they'll be proud of what their work is doing on our stage. 
We want to do it on stage with them. The, the whole concept of the ballet is to do what we're doing one day with the four of them in there, playing their instruments, moving with the crowd, and yeah. Um, before I turn it over to the audience, I just wondered if you could each um, tell us the a thing, because I know there's multiple things you're looking forward to, but something that you're looking forward to this season. Bridget, you want to start? Sorry, pr no pressure. <laughs> pressure. No, it's fine. Um, I think it really is, for me, I've just been looking forward to that feeling of being home again. I mean, we, I mean, we were literally home for a year and a half, and I don't want to be there anymore. I want to be at my ballet home. You know, this is I'm so used to being here from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day. Um, for theater times, we're used to our schedule where we are here for a bit, we go home, we regroup, we're at the theater late, and I'm just looking forward for that sense of normalcy, um, like you said, as much as possible. But just being with everyone, being on stage in the rehearsals, it just, it's a warmth to have back for me. Um, I'm really excited to work with our orchestra again. I miss them, you know, that it's um, even just going from our homes, you know, how much I took class with recorded music over the year, we're so spoiled that we're never, I mean, we have live music throughout the halls all the time. So, I mean, for class every morning, we have our pianists, you know, whatever it's famous ballet tunes or pop songs, or like that live music element is such a, um, an integral part of our day. It can like lift your mood when the pianist comes in and really plays your favorite songs. and. You can think you're tired and they can pick you right up. Um, so I really look forward to that and the spontaneity that performing with live music brings. Um, so, you know, I've just, we've missed them. You know, I, have not, I haven't heard an orchestra yet in so long, so I really look forward to that. You know, just even the, one of my favorite parts when I was a kid going to the theater was hearing the orchestra tune. I just like that moment of like, oh, I'm there. I'm in that moment, you know? I am sitting in the audience and hearing the, oh, sorry, I shouldn't have done that, you know? <laughs> But, um, you know, that, those little magic moments of the reminding that we're doing live theater again, um, that, that's, that'll be really special. I think mine's in the same vein. I think as much as I've loved the access that we've had over the past 18 months to digital ballets and seeing artists across the world and choreographers and their work, it's, it's that anticipation when you're sitting in your seat in a theater that the tune happens with the orchestra, the curtain rises, and that feeling that oh, it's starting. And so I think that anticipation um, as an audience member, um, having that live performance is really exciting to me. I can't wait. And you never know what you're gonna get with a live show as well, like, yeah. right? Like you can watch a video and you can watch it three times and it's the same, but we're gonna go into the theater and yeah. the curtain goes up and there's always that like excitement and nervousness, right? You just don't know what you're gonna see and, and you don't know how it's gonna go and that's great. That's what makes it thrilling, right? We, we got a small taste of that when we were at Miller back in May and I just remember, I think it was Rio, was the first dancer out on stage and it was like, <gasps> It, it was like, I felt myself gasp because it was so exciting I, I, to see that person come out and start dancing. It was so moving that night, yeah. <laughs> it's your turn, Stanton. Well, and that kind of was what I was going to say, that we had that taste of that at Miller, and it wasn't just the reaction, of course, from us as the audience, but they dance differently. And there's a chemistry that only occurs in that moment, and as good as you can be in film and in the studio and in rehearsal, and we rehearse and make it perfect, that, that on stage moment is just, your eyes are different, how you breathe is different, your body is different. Um, and it just reminded me as each one came out and they would grow taller and feel, you know, like it was like a superhero taking off there their normal clothes, and I, I think that that was something that was just so unique and evident in that performance. And when we get the whole group doing it spontaneously, collectively together, I think, yeah. The Justice League and beyond with all of our yeah. dancers, yeah. It's the Marvel one, yeah. because it's so many characters now. Yeah, yeah. well, I don't know those, but I, d I am excited <laughs> for that moment to see everybody. All right, um, so the way that our question and answer is gonna work tonight is that um, if you, hopefully you've had an opportunity to put a question of your own into the chat and someone in, our, in the room is gonna read it aloud and then I'll repeat it into the microphone just to make sure everybody can hear. Tori, do you have something for us? Sure. 
So the question is for Stanton, post-pandemic, if we ever get there, I like that clause, do you think there's still room for video content in our repertoire? Yes, I, I don't think video content was ever really out of our repertoire. It wasn't in focus, it wasn't our entire livelihood, but um, I don't think it should ever go away. I think we need to film our company in the Wortham, not in trauma, like in full spectacular orchestra, music, sets, lights, costume, space, and this collection of dancers to record it forever. And, and remember that, and I think that that's the important thing of film. And then also I think creatively, it's a whole nother outlet of creation, and uh, you can say things with film that you can't, um, we could show Houston in a way that we couldn't, and that appealed to me, and I thought Restoration was so, the city looked sexy and beautiful and modern and funky, and uh, I really liked that, and I thought, uh, that, that we have more to do with that. Also being in the MFA, yeah. more, more collaborative things and video gives us that, that access into that and as long as we stay adaptable, we can find avenues for that. And as Kelly mentioned, I mean, she's, we, we all spent time looking at things over the pandemic, experiencing things in other countries and that kind of thing. It really does expand Houston Ballet, the access to Houston Ballet to people all over the world. Yeah, and it, and it shows, I think, we've done really well. <laughs> and I think that what I'm always really proud of is that the reaction of colleagues in other countries and places, and they're like, how are you producing all of this? And we're like, well, we've just been doing it for a year and a half, and we've been pumping it out. And while, well, you, you know, we were working. We, we never had a week where we weren't at work through all of COVID. Okay, the question is about Houston Ballet's current safety pr protocols so that we can get the dancers and artists back on stage. Kelly, I think that's for you. I'll take that. So currently, um, right now everyone is masked in our building. Um, so the dancers are rehearsing all day and taking class in masks. And we've worked really closely with both Houston Methodist, also with the Dancers Union AGMA, um, to develop a protocol to keep people safe. So as we move into the theater, we do have a testing protocol in place. We do have a vaccination protocol in place so that dancers can remove their masks on stage so that our some of our musicians, our wind players brass. and brass players can remove their masks to play, um, but keeping everybody else masked um, and distanced where possible um, to, to try to keep everybody safe. And that's what we've, we've felt comfortable with and what our partners have suggested to us and we're gonna see how it goes. And we're always chasing the tail, you know, so that before Delta came, the, the plans are always in, in a, a sense of movement. So right now with the city numbers the way they are, we are reacting the way we are. Yeah. And as that changes, we will continue to change and adapt with that. Yeah. And we always wanted to err on the side of caution too, because we felt like that was a priority for us, um, better to, to be safe um, and err on that side of caution and, and keep everyone as protected as possible. And I'll just add, you know, Bridget and I were both on, you know, on our safety committee from the dancers' perspective, and we were always talking to AGMA about any thoughts or concerns and questions, and, and we're so lucky that Houston Ballet, with, especially with the partnership with Methodist, that they were all, almost always eye to eye with how to keep the dancers safe, and we're really fortunate as a group of dancers that we had a, a, a team and organization that was putting our safety first um, it wasn't like we're going to stop making projects because, you know, we can't, we're going to find a way, but safety was first from the get-go. And, and uh, um, I just want, you know, we're really fortunate both for Methodist and for the team that leads the organization that um, has looked out for us, so. Yeah, and um, even now I'm being told from other places that, like, we have the best, like, way of taking care of the dancers. Um, Houston Valley is always going above and beyond to keep us safe and for us that is a huge blessing because we work so closely together we're sweating heavy breathing and so it's nice to know that we are being taken care of and so thank you for letting us do our jobs <laughs> and we are a community you know that ballet companies unlike musicians or actors or we can only do it together we we really can and we survived this stretch of time but if that had gone on indefinitely we, we, we would be in trouble. And so 
I think that that was something really telling about us is that we have to be a team, the choreographers, the musicians, the, the dancers, that we have to come together, work together and find a way collectively and that is inspiring, you know, that, that idea of that the art form is so important to so many of us that we're willing to sacrifice some pretty awful, hideous things to make it happen. To make it happen. And, but then ultimately when you're upstairs and everyone's thumping on the rhythm together and that thrill and you're like, oh, let's unleash this on Houston <laughs> because yeah. it's a, they're ready to go. Yeah, and I think, you know, kudos to the team who made it happen because so far, so good. Everyone really has stayed healthy and safe and um, this rep is our, is, our, is our, the next big hurdle, but there, we have every reason to think that we're going to sail through it the way we've sailed through the rest of the pandemic. And, and um, dodge and weave and... Yeah, well, and float and... Float and float. Dance but, our way through. <laughs> and I will say, just because it seems appropriate, um, while the dancers and the wind and brass will be uh, mask-free... And the singer. And the singer um, will be mask-free at the performance. As Kelly said, everyone else backstage will be masked. And we are requiring masks for our audience members for the Jubilee program, just to be clear about that. Do you know how long the Jubilee is? It's three acts. It's yes. three acts. It's not terribly long. But it's not uh, more than two and a half hours. No, no, no. I think <laughs> the first act would be about 45 minutes, and the middle act would be about 20, and the last act about 16, 15. Tori, why don't, why don't I just bring you this money? <laughs> She's broke the third wall, Jim. <laughs> we don't know what to do as performers sure. anymore. Come back into our space. <laughs> so I will read you a comment from Lisa. Lisa said, I wanted to let you all know that the films were touching and powerful. I cried every time I saw one because of how much I appreciated the innovation. You did not drop the ball. Comment from Lisa, and Randy said, "I think Houston Ballet really stepped up to give us wonderful art during a time where we all really needed it." So, thank you. For us too, I think we needed it. Yeah, and the city really stepped up for us too, right? I mean, uh, there's a huge thanks, and I'm sure anyone who's watching, just our com dance community, who really supported us during this time because um, they know and we know how. It takes, it takes a village, it takes this whole city to kind of look after its arts organizations. So well, big like thanks to people out there who helped us. Houston's had a five year <laughs> rough stretch for the arts in this city from Harvey into this. So we had a practice run as a community and I think. Um, and everybody stepped up. Yeah. yeah. Well, we want to thank you for joining us tonight, and we cannot wait to see you next Thursday through Sunday for the Margaret Alkeck Williams Jubilee of Dance. As Stanton said earlier in the evening, come multiple nights because no two shows will be the same. Uh, we are so thrilled uh, to be back on stage, and we cannot wait to see you at the ballet. Have a great night. <laughs>